Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on cancer. In this video, what we're going to look at is P53. And in particular, we're going to look at uh, P53's response to DNA damage. Uh, well, its involvement in the response to DNA damage. And basically, what we're going to see is that it is involved in, uh, in arresting the cell cycle um, uh, well, arresting the cell cycle in the event that we get uh, DNA damage, response in, response to uh, DNA damage. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, right then, so let's begin. Uh, the way I'm going to structure this video is we're going to begin by, uh, begin with DNA that's going to be damaged. We'll see the entire pathway um, uh, involving P53, and we'll see how it leads to the transcription and expression of a uh, protein known as P21, and then we'll look at what P21's function is, and we'll look at then uh, in, with relation to the cell cycle and arresting the cell cycle, basically. Okay, so uh, let's begin then. So, let's say we have our uh, DNA here, okay, so let's say this is a piece of DNA, and uh, let's say it suffers DNA damage, so let's say potentially some x-rays are going to come in, so let's say this is an x-ray, it's going to come in and maybe it causes the uh, DNA uh, to break into two, so maybe it causes a double strand break, so let's show that. So the DNA has broken in two, so we'll have it breaking down in this middle part here. So we're going to get a double strand break, which means that both of the two complementary strands are going to cleave away. Okay, so that to there, and then this one like so. Right, so we've got this double strand break here in the DNA. Now, what we want to look at is what is the cell's double strand break. We want to look at what is the cell's uh, response to this double strand break and how is P53 involved in this uh, response? And I want to stress that the double strand break is just an example of uh, a way that you could damage the DNA. There are many other ways. You could get a single strand break, for instance. Uh, you could get chemical um, modification to the DNA, so great big uh, chemicals uh, either well, binding to it, basically, that shouldn't be binding to it, etc. There are all sorts of things that could be be, um, classified as damage to the DNA. This is a very archetypal example. Right, okay, um, so basically there are certain proteins which are extremely good at recognizing when DNA is broken. And these have rather fantastic names. So there are two of them that are very much so involved in recognizing DNA damage. One is called ATM, which stands for uh, ataxia telangiectasia, which is an extremely rare uh, disease in which this protein is actually mutated. Ataxia telangiectasia, telangiectasia, if you like, telangiectasia mutated. So that's what it stands for. And it, as I say, it is a... Um, a gene which is mutated uh, from the germline in people with ataxia telangiectasia. So they inherit one uh, copy of this gene mutated and then in, um, in um, cells afterwards they can get a single mutation, a single somatic mutation, and then they've lost the function of this gene. And then there's another one which is called ATR. Um, which stands for ataxia telangiectasia and rad free related protein. So ataxia telangiectasia again, telangiectasia, and that some people pronounce that ta ataxia telangiectasia. I they pronounce the I in the name more than I am. Um, ataxia telangiectasia and rad free mutated. I think both ways of pronouncing it are okay. Rad free, um, rad free um, related protein. Okay. Okay, so ATR stands for ataxia telangiectasia and rad free related protein. So these two proteins are uh, what are known as serine threonine kinases. So let's draw them collectively here. Okay, so that I'm going to draw them with a nice active site there, so like an enzyme. And I will denote this ATM 
slash ATR. But again, that does not denote that it's some sort of chimera of ATM and ATR. No, it means that it's either ATM or it's ATR. And as far as we're concerned, they do pretty much the same thing. Um, if you go more advanced, they do do slightly different things, but they're both recognizing uh, DNA damage, basically. So in the case of DNA damage, you're going to get the activation of ATM and ATR proteins. And basically, they are both what are known as serine threonine kinases. Okay, so I'll just go over the structure of the amino acid serine threonine and what it means to be a serine threonine kinase. Okay, so the structure of the amino acid serine then, so we'll do it down here. So if we start with the basic amino acid structure, let's say this is the alpha carbon, then off of the alpha carbon you have an amino group. All amino acids have this, that's the amino in the amino acid name. Then you also have a carboxylic acid group down here, which is the acid uh, in the name of an amino acid. Okay, and uh, this is a hydrogen off the alpha carbon. Now, what you then have is an R group in here, and in the case of serine, the R group is a methylene group, like so, with a hydroxyl group off of that. Okay, so this is the amino acid serine, and it's one that is used in um, the building of proteins. Another amino acid which is used in the building of proteins is threonine. So let's go over the structure of threonine. So again, here is the amino group of the amino acid, the alpha carbon of the amino acid in the middle here, and then the carboxyl group coming down here. Okay, and now the R group of threonine is that you have a carbon again coming off, and then a hydroxyl group, so exactly the same as serine. Again, a little hydrogen here, but then off here, instead of just having a hydrogen, you have a methyl group. So this is the structure of threonine. Okay, right. So, as you can see, both of these are amino acids. They both have the amino and the acid groups. And uh, they're both proteinergic amino acids, so they're both incorporated into uh, proteins, into polypeptides. Now, uh, serine threonine kinase enzymes add phosphate groups onto these serine and threonine amino acids when they are in proteins. So, um, when these are in proteins, they will be incorporated into a large polypeptide, but their R groups may still be um, free, and these hydroxyl groups can have phosphate groups added onto them. So let me show you how you can add a phosphate group onto this hydroxyl group. So the structure of a phosphate group is that you have a phosphorus atom at the center, double bonded to an oxygen, and then you have uh, two hydroxyl groups coming off of this phosphorus atom, and then also a hydrogen. Okay, so this is the structure of a phosphate group. When people say inorganic phosphate, this is what they mean. Um, uh, this is a phosphate group. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, now if you uh, want to link this phosphate group to that hydroxyl group, what you can do is perform a condensation reaction, which means a reaction which gives off water. So you can take off the hydroxyl group off the phosphorus atom. You can take off the hydrogen off that hydroxyl group on the amino acid, which is either serine or threonine, you can form water from that, so you can make H2O, and then you can link that oxygen to the phosphorus to get uh, a link between that, um, well, between the serine and the phosphate group, and that is the phosphorylated serine residue, or if you do the equivalent thing on the threonine, that's the phosphorylated threonine residue. And basically, phosphorylating these residues can alter the function of the larger protein which these are in, basically. Okay, so ataxia telangiectasia mutated, or ataxia and RAD-free related protein, ATM and ATR, are going to be activated by DNA damage. So they're going to become active serine threonine kinases, which means they're going to add phosphate groups onto other proteins. And basically, the proteins that they target are um, proteins known as checkpoint um, protein 1 and uh, checkpoint protein 2. So we'll look at these in the next video.